Today we're gonna make a 007 Tiki drink. The M1. For this drink, you're gonna need a double old fashioned glass, a jigger, a fancy straw, a cocktail shaker, a Hawthorne strainer, a citrus juicer, a cutting board and a small knife, and optionally, an octopusy cocktail pick. This drink uses scotch, orange liqueur, fresh tangerine juice, aromatic bitters, and optionally a dried pineapple and mint for garnish. This drink is more or less in the tradition of a daisy, like the sidecar or the margarita. It's a spirit with citrus and orange liqueur, only a little more tiki-fied with exotic citrus and a wild garnish. James Bond never drank rum in the books. He and Tiki would not get along. He lived the fantasy and got enough adventure. He didn't need to imagine it on a bar stool. Also, he didn't like sours. And in the books, at least, he was silently contemptuous of anyone who did. He wanted his drinks strong and didn't like them being masked with juice. But he was certainly an advocate for whiskey. So in a way, this one which was created in his honor was sort of fitting. Bond and Tiki were contemporaries that had a lot in common, but at the same time appealed to very different sensibilities. Both were fantasies of escapism and adventures in exotic lands, but one appealed to aspiring elitists, and the other was about letting go of your worries, drinking from communal bowls and embracing other cultures, albeit superficially. This Tiki drink, like so many others, was unearthed by Beach Bum Berry, who found it in the private papers of the once world-famous barman Joe Shalom. Shalom was a chemist turned bartender who created several tiki drinks, but most notably the Suffering Bastard. He was originally from Egypt, which at the time was a British colony. He spoke eight languages, Arabic, English, Spanish, French, German, Greek, Russian, and three dialects of Italian. He was everyone's favorite bartender. Stars, kings, and tycoons asked for him by name. Shalom was there when Egypt broke its colonial shackles and gained its independence from Britain. Unfortunately, Shalom's friendliness with the former ruling class got him thrown in jail for fear of being a spy. A month later, he and his family were exiled. Like a 20th century Moses, he was forced to flee his Egyptian home, leaving a small fortune behind. He relocated to Paris, but not for long, because across the Atlantic, Conrad Hilton was expanding his empire just as Britain's was shrinking. He was a man on a mission to manifest his own destiny. He was bringing America to the world through his hotels. He wanted to drive the communists out by showing off the majesty of mid-century American capitalism, sort of like a profitable St. Patrick. Shalom wasn't such an ideologue. After his experience as a political prisoner, his personal philosophy was, mix well, but shake politics. In 1957, Hilton brought Shalom on board to run the bar program at his new Puerto Rican hotel. Hilton saw the Caribbean as the first stepping stone to the rest of the world. When Hilton set his sights on Cuba, he wanted to distinguish himself by having the only hotel not run by the Mafia. In 1958, he opened the Havana Hilton, the largest hotel in Latin America. Shalom was sent there to run three of the bars, but it didn't last long, because less than 10 months later, Castro had taken Havana. It was Shalom's second revolution in two years, but this time he didn't wait around to see what would happen. And in January 1959, the Havana Hilton became the base of operations for the Revolutionary Army and the de facto new government. Shalom landed in New York, working for Hilton at the Plaza Hotel. He was like a character in a Graham Greene novel, a man caught in the gears of forces he can't see, let alone comprehend. One of those forces turned out to be his longtime employer, Conrad Hilton. Hilton's expansion of his hotel empire was done with the help of the U.S. State Department and direct funding from the Marshall Plan. The hotels were not just shining examples of first world splendor, but also unofficial listening posts. Part of the Cold War spy network in the post-1945 global realignment of world powers. So James Bond was a fictional spy and Joe Shalom was accused of being a spy. But the real spy and fervent cold warrior in all of this turned out to be Conrad Hilton. Over the next five years, Shalom bounced around the world opening bars for Hilton. And when he was at the London Hilton in 1964, Shalom came up with a menu for the 007 Room, a James Bond-themed bar that opened around the release of the film Goldfinger. And this drink, the M1, was from the 007 Room's menu. 
The name is an odd one. The M1 is most famous for being the ubiquitous service weapon from World War II. It's not a firearm that usually comes to mind when you think about James Bond. But in the movie Goldfinger, the soldiers that stormed Fort Knox were armed with M1s. And in the book, Dr. No's henchmen also carried M1s, which Bond eventually had to use to shoot his way off the island. But those are pretty obscure connections to London's favorite double O agent. So perhaps there was another connection. The M1 Garand. That can knock a hole through the helmet of a Hun sniper. Because this rifle can send a shaft of steel right through 12 inches of solid oak to make a leaky bucket out of any sniper's head. Maybe that's the idea behind the name. That this drink will shoot right through your head like it's an M1. Or perhaps it was just meant to appeal to the same masculine sensibilities that the shrunken skull was catering to. In any case, Beach Bombay recommends to make it using a scotch with a little smoke to it. Which is why I like making it with the lightly peated Great King Street Glasgow blend. Also, Shalom's recipe calls for an ounce and a quarter of scotch, but I like making it with a slightly beefier measurement of an ounce and a half. Shalom rarely drank, but when he did, he enjoyed a blended scotch like Dewar's, so you could try making it with a milder blend instead. Shalom was known for using unique juices in his creations. This is an example of where it really pays off. The tangerine juice helps set this drink apart, and is also what gives it its wonderful color. You may be tempted to try and sub in orange juice. And if you're dying to make it and that's all you have available, I'm not going to stop you. But in this case, the tangerine juice really makes the drink. It also pairs particularly well with scotch. So much so that you may want to sub it into your next blood and sand. I'm using the gold nugget variety in mine. But most tangerine varieties will work in this one. The real key is to juice them fresh. After a couple days, they develop a harshness that kills the drink. The M1 is a funky, exciting drink that manages to fuse the worlds of secret agents and tiki surprisingly well. And given Shalom's most famous creation, perhaps this double O tiki drink should have been called the Spying Bastard. Before I get started, I like to cut, squeeze, strain, and bottle my tangerine juice. That way it's easier to pour when it comes time to measure. Next, prep your glass. Whack the rim of your glass with a mint sprig to help release some oils and give it that great aroma. You'll want to hang on to the mint for garnish. Drop in a large chunk of ice and set it aside. Then spear your dried pineapple on your octopusy cocktail pick and set that aside. Next, measure an ounce and a half of scotch. Add that to the shaker. Measure a three quarter ounce of orange liqueur. Add that to the shaker. Measure two ounces of tangerine juice. Add that to the shaker. Then give it a dash of aromatic bitters. Add ice and give everything a good shake to chill it down into the single motion. Strain the contents of your shaker over the ice in your double old-fashioned glass. Then drop in your pineapple, work in your mint, and slide in your straw. And there it is. A drink to help take the spy out of the cold. The M1. A Coli Maluna. You can support this channel by clicking on the Patreon link here. Check out some more videos. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For links, more info, and the printed recipe, check out the description below.